Right. Uh, last, but certainly not least, um, speaker uh, of today uh, is Caroline Allen, who is the uh, is a Green Party spokesperson on panel issues and uh, the London European election candidate. Um, Caroline works as a vet, uh, and very active campaigning on many animal issues, most recently been working on opposing the badger cull, uh, puppy farming as well as factory farming. And today, um, Caroline's uh, uh, talk is the growing food crisis, why the industrial animal farm is bad for animals, people and the environment. Caroline. Um, we've worked alongside Animal Aid on a number of different campaigns over the years. We have a really good relationship and I'm very much hoping that we're going to build on that in the future. Um, please do have a look at our policies. We've got some leaflets going around. Um, also, you can have a look online. I think you'll be really pleasantly surprised by the kind of depth, um, number um, of those policies. And have a look at the work that we do as well. We have a specific group within the Greens that's talking about animal issues and that's Greens for Animal Protection. And we're on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and you can please do follow me as well, if you'd like to. Um, because I'm really proud that the Green Party has these very strong policies, but also has some brilliant elected representatives who are doing a lot of work on these issues. And it's frustrating that we don't always hear about it, because the media likes to concentrate, you know, they come and talk to us when it's climate change, and not necessarily when it's animals. But Jean and the European Parliament is pushing for really strong implementation of the measures that we have achieved on animal welfare and strengthening and always pushing for better rules. She's working to end bullfighting, fighting, which scandalously gets a grant from the EU. That's our taxpayers' money going to support bullfighting. fighting. That is something that we must see end. And taking action on CCTV and slaughterhouses, which is something I know Animal Aid have really been pushing for and is vitally important. Caroline Lucas, MP, has won so many awards for her work on animal issues. And when she was in the European Parliament, her work on um, animal testing, animal experimentation, was really crucial to the great success that we see with ending the testing Europe-wide of cosmetics on animals. So some really great achievements. And she was the proposer of the successful ban on seal fur, which has just been confirmed that that actually can't be blocked by World, world Trade Wars. And that is a real kind of crucial deal breaker. So it's some really great things. Keith Taylor MVP fighting live exports. Sometimes it feels he's fighting the same battles again and again. But he's there, he's down in the southeast, um, and he's really fighting on that, and the foreign pet trade as well. And Jenny Jones, one of our London Assembly members, is fighting for the Wildlife Crime Unit in London, which is really needed. And there's not the sort of will to have the funding. She's really pushing for that, and she's working on that at the moment. They're just a few issues, and obviously we know there's very many issues. I've been active as one of the vets against the badger cull, as has previously been mentioned, and we've just had a talk on that. But there's one issue that I want to talk about, which I believe is one of the most <coughs> crucial. And we're in a very, very bad situation with factory farming at the moment. But from what I see, I'm really concerned that we're at a tipping point of things getting very much worse. And while that's really dangerous, I think it's also an opportunity for us, for people who understand the problems, understand the situation at the moment, to bring that to the wider population, to make them see that what is going on is so fundamentally wrong and damaging to the animals, to us and to the environment, and really make that case all work together there's an opportunity and if we fail then the situation is really very serious so i'm saying you know industrial farming is bad for animals it's bad for the environment it's bad for human health it's bad for consumers so why do we do it you know it just seems obvious to many of us it's got a very long history after the war people were spending an awful lot of money on food 60 percent of the household income um, and this policy, you could say, in many ways has been, until recently, successful because we brought that down to household income, only 9% was then being spent on food. So everyone had a lot more um, disposable income, they felt more wealthy, and this was seen as a, as a success. But what we would argue is that that success in reducing those prices has come at massive, massive costs elsewhere. 
and those costs are still being paid by us, just not directly in our food. And also, they are very large corporations making an awful lot of money. And the costs, again, are going elsewhere. The big argument for intensive farming historically as well was also around food security. That has not been as successful, and we import an awful lot of food, which is becoming increasingly concerning as we find ourselves in the market with growing populations, growing meat-eating populations in China and India. And when we're in a kind of globalised battle with to who buys the food, who gets it cheapest, we're not going to be winning anymore. And we're going to find ourselves um, with more and more food price rises, more and more food banks. And there's a very worrying situation developing of land grabbing where corporations, um, a lot of them going through the city of London, are buying up land um, in the third, predominantly in developing countries, sort of opening it for corporations, British corporations, American corporations, and pushing indigenous people off their lands, um, stealing their water, and this is a real growing situation, it's only going to get worse. Um, we need to think about how we relocalise our food and tackling factory farming is a very good part of that. So how, how does this farming occur? Um, I'm a vet and unfortunately I'm ashamed to say that veterinary medicine has been one of the things that has allowed this factory farming to happen. Um, I believe that factory farming would not be possible without the use of antibiotics because you have very stressed animals crowded together um, in unhygienic, unhygienic situations and so those animals are much more likely to get disease. And so there's massive use of antibiotics, both to treat conditions and also to help animals grow more quickly. And we'll come on to after that why that's a problem. Um, the way that animals are fed. You know, people still think that cows and dairy cows eat grass. And it's just not true anymore. They're fed soy, fish meal. We saw that they were being fed other cows, and that's what caused BSE. You know, these practices have just become acceptable. They're not discussed with us. We're not asked, do we think this is okay? And then these disasters happen. Um, the same thing like acceptable practices on farms. I went through my veterinary training, and you get brainwashed. I have cut off the tails of piglets without anaesthetic and clipped their teeth, because that is what is done. You have to do it because otherwise they bite themselves. There's no discussion as to whether this is okay. There's no discussion as to why the piglets are doing this. It just becomes acceptable. And we've seen very big economies of scale. Um, as the farms get larger, they manage to save money. We have fewer larger abattoirs, so the animals are travelling further. And that has its costs as well. We've seen that um, with the foot and mouth crisis where in the past that would have been just a small area that had a disease outbreak, could have been dealt with. No, those pigs travelled from the north to Essex, spewing viruses as they went, and we ended up with massive costs to you know, the animals and also to the taxpayer from trying to deal with that disease outbreak. And there's a very intensive use of land to produce food, energy, fertiliser, for use on, that, on, that, on those crops to feed the animals, and transportation. So, you know, it's, it's very damaging, but this is how it occurs. And people are being conned. People are being conned about where their meat comes from, how it's produced, um, sort of just made to think, you know, everything's okay. And I just want to do a, a little illustration of the situation with, with pigs and, and where things are going. There's about five million pigs in the UK, that number has been decreasing because it's been difficult for farmers, even in this industrial system in this country, to make enough money. But the average number of pigs kept on one farm has increased. And the tipping point that I'm talking about is what they're saying is we can't make this money with these small units. What we need is mega farms. And Foston in Derbyshire, which Greens have been campaigning against, and it has been rejected, but it keeps coming back, is one such of these mega farms, where an application has been put in for a unit with 2,500 breeding sows, 
and 25,000 pigs and piglets. So that is absolutely massive. And that is the way that we're going. We've just also had a um, planning application <coughs> approved for Omega Dairy Powers. And the minister who approved it, the planning minister who approved it, he admitted, he agreed with local campaigners that there would be detrimental effects on the animals, on the surrounding area because of pollution, on the health of local people um, due to transportation, issues with food, issues with the waste. He agreed, but he said the economic case trumps all of those things. He said that in his statement, you can see it out there. And this is so, so dangerous that we are going down this line and we, we have to be ready to fight that. So the UK consumes um, one and a half million tons, sorry, one, it consumes a lot of pig meat and uh, 1.5 million tons, um, but even now we're importing about half of that. And why is it a con? Um, because consumers are told that it's produced in a quality way. It has a mark, a quality standard, assuring the consumers of the highest standards of animal welfare, quality control, and traceability of products. And it is an absolute con. This is the basic legal standard. It means nothing. It means that 80% of piglets will have had their tails docked and their teeth clipped. And the reason why that's done is because pig's, pig's natural behaviour is um, snuffling around, you know, finding their food, going in the dirt. And it's very important for animals to be able to carry out their natural behaviours. And if we don't allow them to do that, they find an alternate way of carrying out that behaviour. And for piglets, that is snuffling and then chewing on whatever they can find. And when there's nothing else, there's no enrichment, there's nothing, what they do is they chew on other piglets. So the industrial farming answer is not, let's give them something to root around in, let's give them some environmental enrichment. It's let's cut off their teeth and cut off the tails to stop this happening. This is the mentality that we're dealing with. So they have the inability to express their normal behaviour. Um, and they suffer from the transportation, they very, um, suffer from heat stress, and of course, at the end of it, 100% of them get slaughtered. And a lot of us have problems with that, you know, even if everything else was absolutely fine. But it's very far from fine. <coughs> So that's a sort of little bit on the pig situation and just a taste of what's happening to the animals themselves. Um, the environmental sort of side of things, we'll just talk about a little bit more. Um, it is literally the case that animal production is causing the rainforest to be destroyed. That case is very clear. And the reason for that, as I explained, is that we're feeding food that could be fed to people, we're feeding soy, we're feeding wheat, we're feeding other protein sources <coughs> to animals. And they don't convert that very efficiently. So, you know, they might eat, you know, they'll eat a ton of soya, but they'll poo most of it out, or, you know, they'll use it sort of running around, and only a very small percentage of that goes into meat. So producing meat is a very, very inefficient way of us feeding ourselves and feeding the world. So, you know, there's, there's an example here, I mean, the chart just shows you how many kilos of feed you need to get to um, produce an edible product. So, if you feed 10, sort of 10 kilos of feed to, to a cow, you know, you'll only get one kilo out in actual meat that you can eat. So, it's very wasteful. And if we had one hectare of land, we could feed 22 people for a year if we were using potato, if we were growing potatoes. 19 people if it was rice, and only one person if it was beef. But that's what's happening is when that's not happening to land in the UK, it's happening to land in developing countries, and very large parts of that are in the Amazon, now increasingly in Africa, as I say, with these land grabs. So it's incredibly inefficient, and that leads to environmental damage. And water. We know that even now, but increasingly so, as our climate changes, we are going to have water shortages. The situation in Australia where their water table is literally going down like that. We're going to see more and more droughts. 
And intensive livestock production is a very heavy user of water, accounting for more than 8% of global human water use. Obviously some of that is on the farms themselves, you know, the pressure washing everything, the animals have to drink. But a lot of it is going to irrigate this feed that we've just talked about. So, I mean, you, you can see the figures here. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, so many times more in the case of chicken and even more so in the, in the case of beef, how much water we're using. And we don't have water to be wasting in this way. And another aspect of it, I said, meat's not good for the animals, it's not good for the environment, and it's not good for us. And I expect, you know, there's some people in this room who've given up eating meat, you know, for their own health concerns. But there's really no debate on this anymore. There's been study after study after study. Eating meat is not good for your health, it increases the risk of obesity, heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. And what is actually very interesting is that intensively produced meat is actually even worse in this regard, and we're starting to see more evidence of that. Um, industrial chickens contain three times the amount of fat as extensive birds. And you can understand that if you think about it. They're not getting to run around. They're not getting to use their muscles as they should. They're flabby. They're unhealthy. And intensively fed cattle have less beneficial um, omega fatty acids in their meat because they're eating artificial food. You know, they're eating just grains and soy. They're not designed to eat those things. They should be eating grass and those things that come through. And one thing that I think is a really crucial argument, and I think it's an argument that we're going to have to keep making, is around the use of antibiotics. As I explained before, I don't believe that this farming will happen can happen without the use of antibiotics. And there's not lots of studies out there, because funnily enough, the drug companies don't want to fund studies into whether their antibiotics are causing resistance, and there's not a lot of funding. But there are some studies that are coming through, um, very vigorous scientific studies that are published in the right journals, that are showing in human populations there are Bacteria out there, resistant bacteria out there, MRSA and other kinds of bacteria out there that completely match in their profile, in their genetics, in their resistance pattern with ones that are appearing on intensive animal farms. So <coughs> we are literally risking these antibiotics, these life-saving drugs we could not do so much surgery, so much medical intervention, treating so many conditions without antibiotics, we are risking that for cheap meat, for cheap burgers. And I think that that is a, absolutely how this has happened. We haven't been asked that the industry is allowed to get away with this, is one of the biggest scandals. And I think it's something that is being picked up. Um, and you know, the um, chief medical officer has started to talk about it. You know, antibiotic resistance, it is getting out there. And I think it's an opportunity for us as sort of people who really want to see the end to this, as campaigners, to say you know, this is not acceptable and to really push on with this. And actually, in spite of all the use of antibiotics, um, food poisoning from meat products um, is increasing. But as I say, the, the use of antibiotics is not about protecting our health. It's about enabling to keep these animals in conditions that matter. And there's other issues around disease. Um, there's been a few sort of obviously little scares, swine flu, bird flu, um, you know, they've been very localised so far. But again, what you have in these massive sheds of poultry and of pigs is an incredibly stressed population of animals. Their immunity is very low and they are the perfect breeding ground for pandemic viruses. A virus mutates, it will go through that population so quickly and um, you know we've seen with the Spanish flu in the past which basically was, was bred up in people in the trenches um, how devastating this can be and there are researchers out there who have very real concerns about um, the development of pandemic disease in intensive farming and I've already sort of mentioned it BSE these unproven practices these things that they think will be a good idea 
They don't ask us. They just say, oh, you know, we can feed cows back to cows because it will save us some money and it will give them some more protein. <coughs> and then guess what? Feeding a herbivore or meat doesn't work out so well. You end up with BSC, a prion disease, where it's a <coughs> protein that we still don't understand. We still don't know how it replicates. It appears in cows' brains. And us as taxpayers, we all ended up paying the price for this. It wasn't the feed companies who started putting cows in cow food. They didn't pay. We did. So we need to really be opening up and looking, what is going on there? This is not acceptable. These practices are not acceptable. And I've already mentioned foot and mouth and pigs. So I've given a lot of problems, and it can be quite depressing, because this is the sort of farming that's going on now. And with these um, mega farms coming on stream, it's potentially getting worse. But as I say, there is the opportunity for us as interested people, as campaigners, as politicians, to use this now to get in and start making the case and coming up with solutions. Obviously, there are many of us here have already made this decision, eat no meat, dairy, or, you know, some people are increasingly eating less meat. And I think that that is something that we should welcome. And, you know, it's easy to, to criticise people who are just making that journey. Um, I would really urge you to all look at the work of Dr. Melanie Joy. Um, I had the privilege to hear her speak. She's the author of a book called Why We Love Dogs, Wear Cows and Eat Pigs. And it's absolutely fascinating stuff. What she's saying is that if we just tell people, this is really bad, you've got to stop eating meat, and, and talk criticism, people say, why don't you understand? they're not going to get it. And I think we've probably all seen that. And, and I've had to take a journey from where I was cutting pigs' teeth and tongues to where I am now. And the reason why people don't seem to get it, as she argues, she calls it carnism, um, that basically we, many people have been brought up with meat-eating and as a dominant ideology that they are brought up into that being the absolute normal thing to do. It's dominant, aggressive ideology. And that breaking that down is actually quite hard, um, and we need to be much cleverer about it. And you know, it doesn't give us all the answers, but I really urge people who are interested to, to look at that work, because I think you know, as people who try to advocate this, um, it helps explain some things that can be very difficult for us. Um, education is absolutely key, especially if you think about this carnism, getting to people young. So education of young people, getting into schools, um, and that's certainly something that we have very strong policies on, is getting in there early, meat-free diets, um, you know, just making it completely normal, making sure that children understand you know, where meat really comes from, what the situation is. And we have to be aware that we're up against really powerful interests, really unbelievably powerful. Um, Compassion in World Farming shared um, some education material that is going into US schools. And it's pictures of pigs on a sort of little pretend factory farm. And there's a picture of a little child saying, oh, but where's the mud? Don't pigs like mud? And the answer is, oh no, but Mud is dirty and contains disease, and it's much better for them not to be in the mud. This is going in to US schools and is being put there by the massively um, rich and powerful meat industry. And if we are up against um, a very organised, very wealthy enemy, and they are the enemy, um, so we have to be equally clever. I really believe that. But you know, we need to get into school and we need to educate the health professionals as well. I suspect that many of us have been sort of told, oh, you know, but where are you getting your protein from? It's not healthy. And actually a lot of doctors and nurses still believe this because that's what they were taught, the food pyramid. Bit of, you know, some meat at the top, this is what you need. And, you know, it's not their fault. You know, if, if that's what they were taught many years ago, we're all busy, you know, you don't necessarily update yourself, you don't necessarily find out the facts, 
and there's someone sort of says to you, look, you know, this is the reality now. This is, this is the alternative. Um, so I think education is absolutely key, and certainly Greens think education is absolutely key. Um, also working with shops, um, and you know, the supermarkets are a massive problem here. The whole supermarket system, the whole food chain system, you know, it is, I would say, fundamentally broken. You know, we've seen it with horse meat, most recently it's the chickens with one fifth of water that's being tumbled. You know, it's not set up to provide decent, healthy food for us. It's set up for speed, for intensification, and for profit. And so we really need to, to break that, to be honest. Um, and we certainly have policies about doing that, being, having you know, very sort of tough limits on the size of shops, on the position of shops, on the food chain, on competition. Things that will really relocalise our food and get us back in touch with our food. And on politics. Um, obviously, you know, I'm standing for the Green Party because I think that you know, politics can make a difference. You know, it's tough. Um, we've got one MEP, she's brilliant, she's only one. But the European elections are really important because they are um, a PR-based election. Um, which means that your vote really counts in these elections. We have an MVP in London, Jean Lambert, as I've already mentioned. Um, I'm number two on that list. And we have Greens across Europe as well. And they are all working on this issue. And I can assure you that they see this issue, farming, increasing industrialisation, as one of the absolutely key things that we need to be fighting and we need to be campaigning on. So, you know, politics can make a difference. Um, the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy, um, we didn't get all the success, well, we didn't really get many successes in the last round of CAP before. Um, it's still giving far too much money for very large farmers. Um, it's still, we're all still in, indirectly subsidising industrial farming. But these messages are coming through. And if we all work together, then we can really sort of push these messages. And I think we can start to make a difference. Unfortunately, as things stand, the situation politically in this country at the moment is quite depressing. Um, we have uh, a Tory Lib Dem government who are in the pockets of the National Farmers Union, which does not represent smaller scale you know, small scale farmers growing veg, growing potatoes and this kind of thing, it represents the big business, it represents industry. Um, that is who our government support, they support big industry, they support intensive farming. And they also completely gutted the Food Standards um, Agency who were doing some, some good work actually, they were kind of daring to ask these questions about how much meat we should be eating, what is the impact of this, let's get some proper labelling. And the Tories completely just gutted them out, they got rid of all those people doing some really brilliant work. So, and, you know, they're not going to do anything about the supermarkets, I think we can be assured of that. So, it's a depressing situation at the moment, but that can change, you know, we can change that, we do live in a, in a democracy, it's not a perfect democracy, but it can change. So, and also at a council level, you know, there are things that can be done. Um, it's not always easy, and I'll, I'll be honest, you know, in Brighton, we were like, we have like a minority in the council, this is great, we've got these great policies, um, let's start with a meat-free Monday. And you know what, it really demonstrated to us the power of carnism, and that we still have some way to go with making that case. We really thought, this is so obvious, why can't people see the Me Free Monday is the way to go? And you know what? They didn't see it. The refuse workers didn't see it. We tried to make the case, but they didn't see why they couldn't have their bacon sandwich on a Monday or on a Friday. And it didn't work for us. And the German Greens have had the same experience. They had a policy, meat free day, for the general election. And it is generally accepted that, that along with some other things, um, 
did have a negative effect on the number of MPs they got. So, you know, we are trying, we are trying to really push the boundaries, but it is tough. You know, we need to appreciate that. We need to work together to get, you know, the messages out there and to really try and break the spirit of dominant ideology that we that we're dealing with. But we do want to do it um, and we want to work with people to do that. So that was all I wanted to say. I deliberately kept it fairly short because I really like to take questions. Um, I'm happy to take questions on the subject of factory farming. I have worked on these farms. I'm happy to take questions, you know, what goes on, what's the reality. I'm happy to take questions on wider issues, sort of vets, welfare, badger coal, and also on green policies as well. So I really hope we can have a bit of debate and discussion. It's always a bit nicer than just listening to me. So thank you and I look forward to your questions.